So we're going to start with the Gya Kazuki. What I'm going to talk about today is distancing. The next thing we want to do is concentrate on the jab, the punch to the face. Onigashimasu. Welcome back to the Kochiri Karate Center. So, we're going to start off with disclaimer. And it's quite short, sweet, simple. This video will be for people who would like to look into sport karate. If you're not into sport karate, you don't believe in sport karate, don't watch. That easy. Um, if you're into boxing, MMA, full contact fighting, there's no reason to watch. It's not going to be in your field of expertise and it's okay. In your field, you guys rock. In the world of an under eight, learning to bounce and to score points for the sake of playing a game, which we call Shihai Kumite, um, this is how we go about it. It's not real fighting, it's just the game. And more importantly, for instructors trying to improve their ability to teach and to carry a set of ideas across for the purpose of the upliftment of children through sport karate, not through full contact fighting, not through MMA, and not through just doing kata. Some schools, some dojos really like the idea of a little bit of competitive karate. I'm just sharing my expertise. It's not necessarily what I believe in. All right, so let us get started. Okay, so we're starting off simply with the bounce. And our previous video, I kind of spoke about choosing what stance, so whether you're going to be very square, whether you're going to be in the semi or side on. And I said I tended to favor the idea of semi, which is feet about 45 degrees, body 45 degrees, front hand out, and having a bit of a V. So we often talk about the front hand having a V and the back hand looking like an L. All right. Of late, some people are choosing to fight with the double V, both hands up, because they're worried about being kicked because of the sheer number of prolific kickers out there. So whether you're bouncing this way or this way, that's, you know, you've got to adjust and adapt. And so we, we, we covered the bounce and we covered a little bit of movement, um, static movement essentially, because I'm still remaining in the same spot. I'm just marking time against my opponent and trying to set my opponent up. What I'm going to talk about today is distancing. And essentially, when we do sport karate, we need to be able to manage distance. It is one of the criteria to score. So managing distance is essential. And we do the management of distance through our footwork most of the time. And this is very important because it ties in with what scores where. So to backtrack a few steps, we need to understand that most of the time in our videos we say, do what your sensei says. Well, when it comes time for sport karate, we go, do what the rules say. And for the sensei, it is, you need to understand how that rule has been developed over time. Had some fantastic comments about snap back and pull back and different training ideas from different practitioners who are invested in sport karate as part of their dojo structure and part of their dojo livelihood. Thank you very much for your comments. I did read all of them and some of them are absolutely on point with what we have done in our past. All right, we currently do not teach a lot of sport karate. So again, a lot of the stuff I may be presenting could be a little dated according to the latest iteration of the rules. I come from a time period of Kumite where the rules in my country were dominated predominantly by a Shotokan mentality. And so if you didn't execute the technique, the good form, that it resembled something that was the Shotokan style of punch or kick, it sometimes didn't score. So what we found over time was that techniques that were favored by Shotokan became more prolific scorers. And 
obviously the short account practitioners did better than everybody else. If you didn't adjust or adapt, you didn't do well. And then over a period of time, the chief referees internationally, I think, changed. And some of the chief referees who were now no longer influenced by a strong Japanese contingent, a strong Shotokan contingent, started to be influenced massively by Shtoryu or Shukukai. And so the nature of the scoring technique changed. So one of the things that I kind of looked at is that if you want to understand how to score a point, you need to understand the evolution of what constitutes a score. So when it comes to your techniques, they need to basically have a start point, they need to have a full range technique, and they need to have a pullback. So when we look at techniques and we start looking at punches, so we're going to start with the gyakuzuki. When you do a gyakuzuki, the hip will be cocked, the hip will fire, the hand will project, and it'll come back, and it'll pull back to the chamber. And some of the things that need to be looked at that are critical when you're punching for, for sport karate is that the punch is the correct length, that it has the correct timing, but most importantly, where a lot of people fail to score is that they don't have both eyes on the target when they're hitting. So you get this idea, I'm going to do it sideways so you can see that a person is going to go, I've got two eyes on the target at the moment, but as I'm punching, to get that extra little bit of reach, I start twisting my head. So I can still see out of this eye, I can still see out of this eye, but this eye is looking down there. And so you've effectively lost your ability to have 100% zanjin. So if you ever wondered why you're touching the person and not scoring the point, one of the criteria is missing. And so I don't like the idea that when we teach kids, um, other than the real babies, that it's a game of touches, when we start to elevate our teaching and our coaching, we need to get the student or the competitor or the athlete to understand that they need to fulfill all the criteria. Now, on a little side note, I also like to remind parents that you are the greatest referees, as one of my friends always would say, but unfortunately, unless you've actually done the referees course, um, you can't make the decisions. And Often, some of the insanity I hear being screamed and shouted from grandstands by parents leaves me horrified. It's very important that you understand that it's not just touched equals score, but that all six criteria in WKF would be met in order to constitute a score. Now, if WUKF has something similar, then you have to meet all the criteria that WUKF Put out or ITK or for whichever federation you're fighting under. Again, the rules dictate how you will fight. Okay, so this is sport karate and it's the rules dictate how the game is played. It is a game. It's not real fighting, it's a game. All right, and at no point is it a life and death match. It's just a game. All right, some of them you're going to win, some of them you're going to lose. Some of them you might feel you've been done hard by, and others you might get away with being a little lucky. It's life. So we back at our Gyakuzuki, and what we're looking at is that the hip action and the arm action are synchronized, and the punch is moving forward. Try to keep both eyes forward. So some of the things we would often do, if this eye is the dominant eye when the person is doing this, what we do is we put an eye patch over this eye. So when... If I close this eye, when I start going, oh, hold on, I'm looking down there. That's no good. So if I've got this eye closed with an eye patch or a piece of tape, then all of a sudden I realize that my head is moving and maybe I need to move my head this way. So that's the first thing. So on the bounce, you would just be practicing bounce and hit, bounce and hit, bounce and hit. You want the punch to be nice and straight. You do not want the punch to start having this hooking type of trajectory. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. That's our basic on the Gyakuzuki. It's nothing fancy, and remember, we're talking about little beginners, and they're just learning to punch straight and to retrieve. And in terms of vigorous application, what we want to do is we want to make sure that as fast as the punch gets there, 
it must retreat. It must be retracted. So that is what is termed snapback. So punch goes out and back, out and back, out and back. And you really want to concentrate on firing it. Lots of ways to help develop that, but again, it's important to work on it. In terms of contact, in terms of sport karate, surface. And again, read the rules relative to who's fighting. If it's little children, they may be very light tip to the body. As you get older, the tip may escalate to a little bit of a touch. All right, and in the adults, it may be a little bit of a touch. The rules to the face, neck, head, and throat may be different. As a kid growing up, every time somebody got a blood nose, somebody got disqualified. All right, today they realize some people run into the punch, get hit in the nose, and then want the victory. So there are rules against this, and there's a, a set of rules in WKF called Ma Bobby, self endangerment, where you would really have to rely on good judging for them to see that one person is endangering themselves. In that sense, it's very important that that V, that front hand, is constantly up because it is offering some semblance of defense as I'm moving. We're talking about distancing, and the first distance I would like to talk about is something that in tournament fighting is called touch glove. So if this was my opponent's hand, if I reached out and I could just touch their hand without any footwork, just touch. At that distance, we're in what one of my coaches always used to say, the danger zone, the red zone. At this point, if anybody moves, the first person to move is probably going to score because you're both at touching distance with one step. With a lunge step, you're in touching distance to score the point. And a lot of fighting happens at this distance. And for little kiddies, as they are getting closer and closer together and they're learning to apply pressure, we can then start developing something called the trigger fighter. So a trigger fighter come in close, close, close. The moment somebody moves, boom, they hit and they're out. Okay, now, trigger fighters have a touch glove move to score. Trigger fighter has... They're a touch glove, they move, I block score. Trigger fighters can also be um, that person, I move, they move back, and I follow through with my second technique to score. So the necessity for having a combination, an advancing combination. And the third scenario is on defense, that a trigger fighter may be a touch glove and feels the pressure coming on, and they retreat with half a step before moving forward. The problem with moving backwards to score is that the general rules are that if you're moving backwards and your energy is going backwards, chances are if you hit, you're not scoring. So it's important to have something that looks like a double step. So one step to retreat, other step to plant and to drive forward. Or move back and then push that hip forward. What's critical for that technique is the ball of the foot and the rotation onto that front of that foot. So if I'm standing and I retreat and my leg goes this way as I punch, I'm not gonna have any energy, any impetus. And I brought this up that you need to hit so hard, it is so vigorous in its nature that the intention is to destroy that person. The only reason it doesn't happen is because we apply what is termed sporting attitude, which is the control factor. So if this leg is going that way, there's no way I can have anything there with my hand. However, if I turn that foot that way, and I roll it forward, and I push my hip forward, it's like doing a lunge. So one of the things you end up seeing a lot of is a lot of lunging and dropping. And that builds that. So in terms of a young fighter and developing young fighters, quad strength is essential. So a lot of lunging helps facilitate leg development in younger fighters so that they can have the strength to move forward. Static lunge hold is also important as well as the bob. And this is designed to try and get the person's quads stronger and used to that constant kind of vibration or bounce 
created. Thereafter, let me do it sideways, and hopefully I can still do it, it is to raise both heels and to bounce in that kind of semi-position with defense up. Okay? And this is how we develop certain facets, such as the conditioning of the average fighter. Obviously, you, if you strengthen the quads, you have to strengthen the hamstrings and the glutes. You have to develop the entire body. But for a lot of people, it's that primary just wall that they hit when they have to drop and their legs get tired. As fighters get tired, they tend to lift up and they tend to roll over the top. And we saw a lot of this in the development of the Kumite that we were practicing in our dojo over the last couple of years. One of the most important things we worked on over time was a good old fashioned line drill. We stood with the back foot against the wall. There was no retreating and everything was forward. And one of the first things we worked on was the position or the angle of the back foot. So a lot of people tend to relax that back foot. See a lot of fighters today, very relaxed, back foot even pointing 45 degrees towards the back. And my logic is that tends to want to go when the knee bends that way. Um, I prefer it facing forward. So when it presses forward, I'm going forward. So it's critical that when you're starting to work on the bounce that you start hitting this. Then you start adding in the movement. So I'm going to move back. And so I'm going to be here. I'm not at touch glove. I would like you to imagine that there's somebody in front of me standing with their hand about. There's my body. Their hand about here. Kind of over there is the line from the camera to my opponent's hand. So if I'm touching, I'm touching glove here. All right. So now that's the body and all I'm going to do is mark the point. When I hit, two eyes on and hand to chamber. Please concentrate on touch and full withdrawal or snap back. And this is critical for single techniques. It helps mark the point at that point and it helps sell the point. Um, never been a fan of this, and we brought it up in the last video. Um, always been a fan of this and continuous guard up. In terms of target, if we're right on right or left on left, what we're trying to do is we're trying to hit the small flat area below their elbow. So you're trying to slot your Gyakuzuki into that gap, and that is the best target. The moment if your opponent is standing and they're in a semi position, the moment you aim for their belly button, you're hitting a, it's not a flat surface, you're hitting a surface at an angle. And what's going to happen is you're going to touch and you're going to ricochet. So you're going to get what in olden days you would see the referees slide their hand past the stomach and signal no point, um, a glancing blow. You really want to make sure you're hitting into a flat area. You want to hit directly onto the surface. So as the person is standing, that is that surface there. So that's what you're aiming for. If you are fighting right against left, it's a little bit different because we've then got to play a different like concept on who moves first, who gets the outside line, and who can mark the point onto the more central part because if you're both twitch fighters and you're both punching at the same time, the person, the person who hits down the center line is the person who is going to score the proverbial point. The next thing we want to do is concentrate on the jab, the punch to the face. Now, in terms of how children's rules are often read, the punch may not touch the face. And the, the rule is very simple. We're not in the game of knocking our opponent out. So there is often a very large distance allocated as the scoring area when a punch is executed towards the face, neck, throw it, or head. All right, so this, uh, the only way to explain it is you take a bucket and you put it over the person's head. If you hit this outside of that bucket 
and there is no defense offered, then guess what? It's a score, as long as it meets all the other scoring criteria. So you'll see this thing of punches going to the face, like this, and lots of them are trying to jab, and they're just doing this, and the biggest problem is there is this fear of the full range technique. So if I'm at the point where I'm touching a bag, and I'm going touch and back, touch and back, touch and back, I'm gonna do it from the other angle. Touch, back. Notice that my guard shifts. I bring this hand through to create an extra layer of defense. That's important. And so you would be working that touch and back. Uh, touch and back. Touch and back. And this idea would help you work on creating a good score with the jab. So along the way, we had many students who were constantly being uh, penalized for excessive contact to the face. And we had to try to find a way to teach those students how to attack the face and to manage distance correctly. So the harsh brutality of how we did it was we used the wall. Nobody wants to punch the wall. Wall's hard, it hurts your hands. And what we did was we took a sheet of paper and stuck some press stick. I don't know if what press stick is called around the world. It's like a sticky kind of reusable like putty. And I'm going to use the punch bag. At face level, we would make a bubble. So you end up with this bubble effect. Hopefully the bag will stay in that position. And you would now practice the jab to hit the paper and not crunch it, okay? If you were crunching the paper, obviously it's not a nice soft bag, but the hard wall. So after about two or three punches, you learn very quickly. You can't just throw your best hardest punch and whack the person in the nose, blood, disqualification, and then parents up in arms because they've paid money to go on tour or whatever. So making the most of every single point and trying to coach people um, this might be a better way to work on a punch that is realistic. It's got something that they're touching, but it is not where they should be aiming. The real target is back here. Unfortunately, this lends itself to being called a pulled punch for the sake of um, not hurting your opponent. But in reality, all it is is a punch at a different distance. So it still meets all the criteria of a proper punch at that distance. It's full extension, my body weight, everything moving forward, and then coming back. So if I'm meeting all those criteria, it's actually still a good thing. It's not this very defensive. And so you're looking for this really long, elongated punch that is going to score. It's critical to understand that we're looking for longer techniques, especially with punches, for one simple reason. They like the idea of the punch needs to accelerate over distance to create energy. Now this might not fit in with how some schools believe energy is created in a punch or a striking technique. After all, we took Gautariu, and Gautariu's idea is, I can create energy here, they can still do the same kind of damage. However, if I do this little hurricane at a competition like WKF or WUKF, I'm not going to score. I have to look at what the evolution of the rules are and how the referees are looking at what scores. And there are flavors. There will be a tournament where a whole bunch of referees want to see something particular. And the moment they see it, they're putting out their flags for it. And the next tournament, it won't be that anymore. And that's part of the difficulty with these kind of competitive events. Now, coming from the Southern Hemisphere and having to travel to other parts of the world where we don't know what the flavor of the month is, we're always taking everything in as quickly as possible and trying to adjust. And sometimes it's just overwhelming. Um, the general complaint of anybody who lives 
far away in the southern hemisphere and trying to compete against strong European countries is that we're always on the back foot trying to catch up with what they're doing. Some countries have had fantastic success from the southern hemisphere, but not everybody. Poorer countries, countries in Africa and Latin America have not necessarily had the success of European countries because of a socioeconomic disparity. And that's something to consider. This is an expensive pastime. And some countries, athletes are paid to compete at this game of touches. Okay? And it's, it's like a soccer player. He gets paid a lot of money to dance around the ball. And sometimes you've got fantastic footballers who never get a chance because they're just they're playing football with a whole bunch of plastic rolled together um, to make a ball. And they don't get sighted or spotted. Um, and that, that, that's the same kind of parallel that we've got to draw. So as you're working on this, you've got to make the most of whatever opportunity you're going to get given to compete. So if you get that one chance to go to a competition in another country and to represent your country or to represent your dojo or your federation or whatever at the competition, you need to make the most of it, which means you have to prepare adequately. And if you're not preparing adequately, you're going to have problems. Today we've just worked on the jab, the reverse punch, and the basic idea of twitch punching, which uses a very, very small lunge, front foot moving forward to mark or to score the point from something called touch glove. If you reach out and you could touch their glove with one foot movement, oh, oh no, Hansoku, with one foot movement, you could score or score. And that is critical, is understanding that first distance. That first distance is the distance that helps define what you need to do of other distances. I haven't included kicks yet because obviously kicks take a different range, a different length, and a different kind of technique. Not everybody's a natural born kicker, but everybody can become a prolific kicker with lots of training. I think we're gonna call that a wrap for tonight. Hope you enjoyed it. And leave some comments if you find this useful. Let's keep real fighting one side, real grappling one side, real physical interaction one side. And let's just remember this is for little ones who are learning how to play a game because many dojos out there have little ones who like to compete. And there are many dojos out there who are looking for the resources to improve their ability to teach and to improve their students' ability to compete. So I hope this fulfills that niche. Um, yeah, that's it for tonight. Thank you very much. We hit 10,000 subscribers. We hit 40,000 watch hours. And we had something that I would consider our first kind of viral video. Um, about two weeks ago, our first video on Kumite Drills. And at this point, I think sitting at 32,000 views, which for me is totally mind boggling. Everybody who enjoyed watching it and everybody who got a giggle watching it. Cool, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. Arigato gozaimasu. Sayonara. Have an awesome weekend.